Well, welcome to the second lecture in this year's celebration entitled The History and Migration of the Yakutat Kwashki Kwan, Kwan Clan from Copper River to Yakutat. Um, this is exciting. This is probably the largest turnout we've had in any of our lectures and uh, closely exceeding our capacity here. Um, um, the presentation will discuss the origin of the Kwashki Kwan clan in the Copper River area and their migration to the coast and down towards Yakutat and settlement there. Um, the presenter is Judith Dahutsu Ramos, Assistant Professor, Alaska Department of Native Studies and World Development, UAF, and Indigenous Studies PhD candidate at UAF. Professor Ramos is a member of the Kwashki Kwan clan and serves as the NAGPRA officer of the Yakutat Clinket tribe and has also worked as a subsistence researcher documenting TEK, the sockeye salmon fishery in Dry Bay. Uh, she's currently working on indigenous TEK surrounding seal hunting and uh, has been working on that for several years and she may talk about more she hopes to accomplish in that area, but she's been uh, doing contributing a lot to that project, which is a multi-group project involving National Science Foundation, the Smithsonian, Yakutat Tribe, and others. And uh, it's been, and we've we've been happy to be a small participant in that in um, authorizing excavations on a uh, Sea Alaska Corporation historic site there, one of the 14 H1 sites belonging to the corporation, and that's made a huge contribution to our knowledge of that area. Um, without further ado, I'll thank you for coming. All right. Kanekshish, kanekshish hat yadi, the hutsu you hat to asak. I'm going to try and speak up because I'm usually pretty soft-spoken, but I know my dad in the middle there, he's hard of hearing. And my, my auntie here is kind of hard of hearing. <laughs> so I'm going to try and speak up for my, my aunties and the, the elders here. Um, I am uh, from Yaktat, and um, I'm very honored to give this lecture on our history. And one of the things I really found interesting when I uh, started uh, putting this together was the integration of our songs. And so I'll be, I embedded a few of our songs because uh, through the songs we carried our history. And uh, I want to end with a, a people, uh, an Atna song, which uh, shows how closely we are related to the Atna people. Because uh, as I was growing up, my uh, elders always said, uh, you are from Chitna, you are Copper River people, and remember your history. So this has been, um, this is the people of who we are and a little bit about our migration story and some of the important uh, village sites and historical sites that are now in the Yaktat area. And uh, it's been interesting working with uh, the scientists, with uh, like Dr. Aaron Kroll, and uh, to put the material evidence as far as integrating the oral history with <laughs> our story of our migration. Because in the Tlingit thought, uh, time doesn't mean anything. Because uh, for us, the living past is just as real today but with a uh, with Western science point of view, they want to know dates and dates and dates and when did this happen and things like that. And to us, uh, the dates were not important, but the relationship of that place to us is what's important. So that's what I wanted to kind of focus a little bit about that because um, through this history and timeline, the stories and the songs, uh, we identify our cosmology. So as a PhD student, they always want to focus on cosmology, epistemology, and things like that, which words uh, that I don't understand, but if I relate it back to who I am, then I have a little better understanding of epistemology and cosmology. And these words that are, um, uh, don't mean, but when you look at how they mean to us, who we are as a people, that's, uh, that's where the meaning comes from. So uh, just a little background. I am a Raven Moiti. I'm Koshka Kwan and Gene Kwan. Uh, Gene Kwan is uh, our real true original name from uh, our uh, ancestor relationship. I'm from the House of the Owl. I'm the daughter of the Coho Salmon people from Dry Bay. And I'm also granddaughter of the Brown Bear Tequedi clan. So I have a lot of my 
relative here. So if you're Koho or Tequidi or Kashkakon, maybe you can raise your hand. Uh, I know a lot of my Koho and my Tequidi family are back there. Uh, Morgan's, uh, Howard's family, and uh, my Koho family, my Kashkakon family. So gonna cheesh, thank you. <coughs> So this gives you a little background of the, the whole Gulf Coast of Alaska. So my people occupy the whole Gulf Coast from Latuya Bay all the way up to what we call Cape Suckling uh, or even up to Copper River. So this shows you our traditional homeland and we all, my dad always, when he talks, he says that we people, we, are, we occupy the whole Gulf Coast of Alaska and he claims and Forest Service only gives us a little bit so he's always talking about Forest Service took away all our land <laughs> but actually we are surrounded by uh, two two national parks and Forest Service so we do have quite a lot of federal land in there we're the homeland of Malaspina Glacier uh, Situ uh, and uh, the homeland of uh, Mount St. Elias which is uh, the fourth highest mountain in North America <coughs> and Hubbard Glacier. Uh, so this is our whole coastline of, uh, of here. So when we talk about our history, uh, the Hubbard Glacier is all the way back here, but when we talk about our history, Hubbard Glacier covered the whole bay. So our name for Malaspina and Hubbard Glacier is the same, the same name because in our history it was the same glacier. And then they start receding, became two glaciers, but our Traditional names for uh, Malaspina and Hubbard is the same name because it's the same glacier in our oil history. So this is our homeland. So this is, uh, so as we talk about this area, this is uh, the Akatat area. So our homeland uh, ends just uh, here by Lost River and it starts just west of Icy Bay. So the Kwan homeland is this whole area. So. This is our traditional homeland and we're surrounded by all these beautiful mountains and glaciers. And uh, our origin story comes up from Chitna up the Copper River. So this is a little background of that area. So when I talk about our, our myth and legend, if you look at our stories, many of our stories uh, relate back to how Raven transformed um, the, the land through, uh, through uh, different things that happened. So it's uh, usually only raven or uh, we call it adolescent girls. Uh, so they had the power to transform animals and people into rocks. So if you're looking at uh, the Controller Bay area, there's uh, one big island we call Big Kayak Island, which is a whale. Wingham Island is raven's kayak. Rocks here are raven's harpoon and raven's floats. In that Cape Yakutaga is this rock formation here which we call it uh, Raymond's Canoe Road. So it's a pretty interesting looking at that. There's also another rock formation, we call it the place where Raymond's wife threw his ads ashore and he threw her sewing basket overboard after they had an argument. So we now we say every time couples are going on a trip, they have to have an argument. <laughs> 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 so we know the thing at humor that people, you know, the couples always argue before they go on a trip. So that's, that's a rock that shows that history. Dry Bay um, is a very important area in our mythologies. It's where a raven opened the box of daylight. You can see the rocks that are trying to run away when the flash of light that happened there. The sand hills there shows where a raven was kicking the sand up when he was pulling ashore a big, uh, big canoe, or they call it island, that was full of all the animals. And there's also a whale island there. And you can tell by the colors, it's got the colors of the whale, the, the black and the white, and there's a, sp a spout that would spout. Um, so this is the, <coughs> our creation in mythology. When we look at the landscape, uh, all has a story or explanation behind it. So <coughs> when we talk about our cosmology of who we are as a people, um, our, our identity is tied to this land through these stories and myths and songs and legend. And this relationship uh, is symbolized on our crest, our atu, that we wear and that we have, that we surround us with. And it's validated at potlatches and by story at uh, oral history. So this is how we validate that. Um, elders always say our deed is on our regalia, on the blankets that we wear. So we acquire our cosmology and our names from place. So oral history recounts the stories of how uh, we acquired the land and our name. 
So each of the clans have a story, and sometimes as they migrate along uh, to different places, they acquired different names and became divided up to different clans. Uh, so some clans um, have been related to each other in the past, but they, they now have different names. So it's important for young people to know the, the deep history, the old history of where they came from so they know who they're related. So my example is my father's clan. When uh, the big flood came down in Dry Bay, they had a big flood that divided the people, and some of them left and became other clans. So some of these people don't know that they originally were from Dry Bay, but they do carry a different clan name. My, so my clan name, and if you look at uh, Yakutat, there's a little creek there. We call it uh, Humpy Creek. It's Quash, which is uh, Humpy in uh, uh, Iyak, and Kwan, which is people love in Tlingit. So if you look at the place names of the Yakutat Bay, there's a few sites which are originally Aleut names. The, the whole um, half of the bay all the way up is Iyak, and the whole bay is uh, now Tlingit. So you have different layers of place names that show the peop different people that came and named the place. So this was interesting research to looking how place names relate to our migrations of people and then the names became, uh, the EAC names became clinkatized or mixed together. So that shows in our name that where our name, Kwashkaquan, is, is EAC and Klingit. Because we're clinkatized EACs. <laughs> so if you look at the whole uh, coast of Alaska, and again, here's a map between um, Copper River all the way down to Latuya Bay. We have five what we call traditional landowners in our area. So if Kwans, we have three Kwans. So each of the physical territories are Kwans. So this is the Yakutat Kwan, and then the Kayak, Kayak um, Kagantan, and then in Dry Bay is the Gunaku Kwan people. So we have three Kwans in our territory and five landowners. So the northern one is the Kaya Kaya Kaguantan, and they have the uh, three main clans. And then our area in Yakutat, the Tlachayik, uh, Yakutat Kwan, our uh, Koshka Kwan and Tekwidi clans. And then in Dry Bay is the Gunahu Kwan, the Dry Bay people. And the Gunahu Kwan is people who are uh, strangers because they had mixed in with the Athabascans from the interior are the Tlitnachati and the Shango KD clans. And the Tlitnachati also claim um, uh, heritage through they, they were part of the uh, Tlitnachati people at that time. So this is the traditional territories and the clan territories of the Yakutat people. So again, I, I mentioned uh, these are all the place names from the Yakutat Kwan, the, just the Yakutat Kwan people. So um, it gives you a little idea of uh, how many of these places have traditional names. So our original name, we call it the Gane Kwan people, or copper diggers. And that, origin that name originates back from uh, the Apna area, which is the now the, uh, with the original name for Bremner's Creek on the Chitna Apna area. And so we had um, our original first site in the Akatat was the Night Island. Other village site is Nesu Dot at Lost River, Aka, Summit Lake, Kantak Island, and Port Margrave was our last traditional village. And I'll, I'll give a little more history on each of those villages. So uh, I call this when we were I Atna. So our elders, they say that we were uh, Ikaha Kwan. Ikaha Kwan. Uh, Ik was our name for the copper. So we are the copper people. And the story, um, when we talk about it, the dance that comes from that area was, we call it now the spear dance, and you've seen our young people dance it. So this is a very beautiful story, and uh, this is one that uh, Doc, uh, Harry Bremner talked about. And he talks about uh, McCarthy Indians, which were probably, uh, De Laguna mentioned, were probably Nabesda or Apatana uh, people. He had a potlatch, and he invited uh, our clan and another clan, and we were traditionally um, used to war with them. So we didn't really trust them, but we had to stay with, uh, told to stay together in one village with them. But our, our tribe was afraid of them, so we had to beat them in a dance. So we, as a tribe, had a meeting, and then we decided we were going to dance with a spear, but we were going to hide 
the spears under eagle feathers because we didn't trust that other clan. <laughs> and they also comp uh, we composed a song just for that dance. It's a spear dance. The other tribe had a ketu, which is the war picks. They also covered it with feathers, so they didn't <laughs> trust it either. <laughs> <laughs> so when they came down and they anchored outside of the village, they anchored in their canoes outside of the village and they didn't come in because they didn't trust it. Um, so we went marching out and you see the song, <coughs> we go marching out with the spear dance and dancing side to side. And the women were lined up at the edge of the water and they started the war song. They held up the spears and they charged forward and they stopped at the water's edge and they, and they came back. Uh, in the, so in, the, in the song, they have three charges, and the, traditionally, uh, Harry Bremner says there was always a man in front that would hold the people back. So at that time, when they, we charged those three times, and we decided it was peace. So the, the, he says, so the other ones in the water knows that there's no war just to dance. And uh, my mother was telling my son, Kai, one version where s the first line of warriors to actually fall in the water because the sand bank was soft there, mm -hmm. but that, uh, that's uh, oral history. So when we came down, we brought this song and seven other songs that tells the story of our migration from the interior to the coast. So I'm going to just play a short clip of this. So this is when we're marching in to the song. This is the charge with the men with the spears holding it up. And this is, here's the charge. And so that's a short clip, and you, you've seen our dancers do that song. And they charge three times, and then they back up. So, so besides these songs and stories I refer to as our cosmology, we brought our names. So a lot of our names that we carry today are originally Atna. We brought the, our regalia, and our traditional regalia was the traditional Atna style that we use, and we brought copper. <coughs> So uh, Ganeik, uh, uh, Harry Bremner says this is the name for the big Bremner River, which is the cross from Chitna. So this is a map of our um, possible migration route, which is uh, from Chitna uh, down the rivers and then over the glaciers down to uh, just uh, to, uh, to this river here. And that's <coughs> one possible migration route in the the history says that some of the prospectors at the turn of the 19th century did find, uh, try to use this prospectus trail and did find evidence of wood up there on the glacier. So this is the possible migration route that we came down over the glaciers and down to the icy bay area. So our history begins in Chitna and the sto first story was the, that we talk about was when the chief of the ravens at Chitna died and left behind a, what they call a big uh, moose horn dish. So there was a kind of fight between the, the inheritors of that big mo moose horn dish and the tri on the side, the brothers that did not get that dish um, were the ones that left Chitna and started migrating down the coast. So this is the, this is the story of how we started uh, down there. So as we were um, coming down, uh, leaving the village, uh, we, uh, we used this marching song. This is kind of a sad song because uh, we were leaving behind our family and relatives in Chitna and it was very sorrowful for the people because we were leaving half our family behind as we left. So it's kind of a sad song, um, but it's, uh, they call it the marching song because just think uh, you have to leave your sister, your mother, your brothers and you, you decided to leave and you had to leave your family behind. So it's, it was pretty sad for them to leave their family behind. This is one reason the elders said that it was kind of a sad song. So they traditionally used to sing these songs when they were walking to the house and we were about to be guests at a Paulatz. Uh, this is how they used to use the song uh, today. 
so uh, as we were traveling over the glacier, uh, another song that they composed is we call it the Atna Resting Song. So this is um, was supposed to have been composed when uh, we rested on the prairies during the journey across the song. Um, so they now sing it at, uh, when they pause at the door of the house to which they have been invited. So this is the, the Atna Resting Song. <laughs> So this is just a, a, a little piece of it. Uh, so um, <coughs> another song that they composed, and uh, that song hasn't been recorded, but it was, uh, as they were uh, leaving uh, Chitna, they came across a fog on the glacier. And then one of the a part of the group started going one way and the other went the other way. So they started calling back and forth to each other in the fog, and they were going like, woo, woo, woo. And they, but as they got lost in the fog, they kept, kept getting further and further apart. And so this was, uh, I told, was a song that incorporated the story about uh, getting lost in the fog and calling back for and forth to each other in the fog. And as the group separated, uh, one group ended up at uh, what is uh, the mouth of Copper River, and the other group uh, is our group that ended up in Yakutat. Uh, uh, so as they uh, was uh, going along uh, on the glacier, they saw what to them looked like a wolverine. And um, they said they used this as a compass, uh, walked it towards it. And they later, when they came back to it, they found it uh, like a little island in the middle of the glacier with trees on it. And I think there's a scientific name for a little I call it a retreat from the glacier that didn't get covered by the glacier, but it's a little island with trees on it. Uh, they said later on they, they came across a wolverine that, that killed it uh, because they were starving. They didn't have any food. So this is one story about it. The next thing that they saw was what to them looked like a rabbit on the glacier. And when they got to glacier, they saw it was uh, the top of a mountain, which is now uh, called Mount St. Elias. And this became our compass, and this is why we use it as a crest. So this is uh, the how we discovered and used Mount St. Elias because it was our compass as we were lost among the glaciers and the mountains. As they were uh, also journeying along this uh, voyage, uh, there's a sad story about a, a young, two young brothers that were out hunting, and they were wearing a bear rug and uh, picking berries, and accidentally uh, one brother shot the other brother he thought it was a bear, so mm -hmm. he didn't know how he was going to tell his family when he was bringing his brother's body back. So as he was coming back to the village, he composed this very sad morning song about um, uh, his uh, brother that he accidentally killed and that he would never see again. So he sang the song when he was coming back so the people would know what had happened. So this is the lament. They call it the lament uh, for the, uh, the brother. Uh, As you notice in there, they say Mataya, the song. Um, you know, the Klingits don't have that. So the, you know this is uh, not a Klingit um, language. But it's a pretty sad song, and we still sing it at our Kuis or Potlatches today. This is one of the songs. So it's a really sad song. Another song that they compose, uh, they call it, uh, I call it Coming Down the Side of the Mountain Song. So um, this is um, a, a, a part of the mountains when the glaciers were so formed, so they were like layers or stumps all the way down. And they said that they made songs and danced down each layer or platform until they came down to the beach to the water. 
So this is another song that they composed, but of course we don't have that, uh, that song recorded. So this next portion, I call it uh, Wase Tu Sha. So uh, as we finished coming down the glacier, we, d we d came down to what is now Icy Bay. So this is the first time we had ever seen the ocean before because we were up in the interior. Everything was, I told my grandma, I said everything was new to them. They have never seen the ocean. They have never seen seagulls. They have never seen sea otters before. So this is a whole totally different environment for them and they had to kind of relearn how to adjust to this new environment and this new world that they came. The first uh, place they established, they call it the Yellow Cedar Bark Town, and I had always wondered, because there's no cedar in the Yakutap, but uh, I was talking to some loggers, and they said there was some cedar up in Icy Bay, a refugia from the uh, glaciation, and they said when the um, state logged that land out, they cut down trees with canoes were still in the trees. So um, they said there were a couple of house pits that they found, but I have never been up there to locate these, um, this, these house pits. And uh, it was David Beatty, if you guys know him, he had promised that he, he died, that he would come back and show us where those house pits were. So we, 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 uh, the first house that we created, we called it the Mountain House. It's one version I heard. They also call it the, the, the um, the yellow cedar bark, because they use the bark for their, their houses. <coughs> um, so um, uh, this first village was also o overran by glacier, because what happened, there was some young people, and young people were, had a taboo. They were cooking keen salmon along the beach, and they were jokingly saying, glacier, glacier, come and eat with us. And the glacier overran the village. So the taboo is that you never, that was really disrespectful to say that, to, to, to make jokes about the glacier, because the, um, that was, that's uh, one story that the glacier overran this village because mm -hmm. the young people were teasing the glacier. And they say it was a mistake to like, invite the glacier to eat. They say it afterwards it started growing. And that's uh, the first village. Along during this time they lived at Icy Bay there was a sad story about a young boy that was, uh, fell in one of the ice crevices, but he didn't die right away. They could still hear him crying, and they couldn't rescue him. And so it was pretty sad and traumatic for the people because they could still hear the young man crying in the ice crevice. His name is Tla'a, and we still carry this name in our village today. And after he died, there's a story about this uh, young mother. She uh, adopted a seagull. Uh, to be her son in replace of this, her son that had died in the crevice. So um, she raised it like a son, and the bird would bring them food, and it also saved them starvation. Also, they had never seen the seagull before, and she was very sad because uh, they, uh, some of the people were saying that the seagull brought them bad luck and had made her send it away. But this is when she composed the song. Uh, when she saw the seagull going back into the water, so it was a really sad song. Uh, there was also another story about another woman that raised a sea otter, uh, but I don't have that full story before it. <coughs> um, others important um, songs are the Atna dance song and the owl chant. And um, because we're in, in mourning right now, I'm not going to do the owl chant song, but it's a beautiful uh, song that we we have is the Awa chant song and the Atna dance song. The next thing that happened is they were the young hunters came back and they reported back that they had seen some blood on the ice. So that that's how that we knew that there were other people that were living there and they uh, became, we call them the Gahya Kogwantan and we started intermarrying with them because we were ravens and they were eagles so it was uh, okay uh, to marry them because they were uh, from different moieties. So this is how we started uh, a relationship with the Kagwan town people. So uh, at that time, um, they were, we were living in Icy Bay, and then at this time you can see how um, Glacier Terminus covers the whole Yakutat Bay, and then um, the only places that were not covered maybe was from the sites from Lost River, and there's a site that uh, was excavated here. And so these sites that here are probably like 800 years old from the excavations that we know. So this is last couple of years we have ex excavated 
with Dr. Aaron Crowell, a couple of other sites, Old Town, and then uh, some of the sites up there, and he excavated this site. So uh, he has a lot more data that has come about as those recent excavations and reports that he have. So this is kind of gives you a little bit about uh, the glaciers receding. And our current research is looking how we established the different steel camps as the glacier receded down there. So <coughs> when we came down, there's two different uh, in the oral, I mean the stories about maybe two different um, people that were there that we bought the land from. One we call the uh, Hinyeti, another version says they were Aleuts. But uh, my dad and I were up in Teslin and uh, he asked them, well, do you ever hear the story from Yakutat? And uh, one of the people, village, uh, elders up there, this is like 20 years ago, says that, yeah, we did, we were there and we did come back up and settled in Kwakwan and it came up the interior to, to the Yukon area, but they changed their name to the Ishkahakakwan Ishka people. So there are maybe different versions of who are original and land owners that we are, that were there. So, but uh, what happened is we were living in Icy Bay and there were, um, a Yad fellow uh, walked up through the ice to the mountains near Mount Tabanov and Russell Fjord and they saw that there was some peeled celery there. So they knew there were people there because they saw the peeled celery. Uh, so when they, we came, it says that the people, uh, the glacier, let me go back here, there was a glacier across from Point Latouche across to Mamby Island. Uh, Mamby side was all then all ice and Night Island was bare of trees. It was just full of uh, strawberries. So uh, oral history says that uh, how they killed a dog and put it in one of the crevices and that is why the glacier receded so far and that's it. Uh, then the bay which is exposed, there is is uh, in uh, Iaka Klinka, there's, our, there's already a kind of lagoon forming in there. That's in their language, the Tlachayik uh, people. So that's one of the names for that bay is for there's a lagoon behind it. This comes from when uh, the glacier was beginning to recede. So <coughs> at Night Island, it was just a strawberry field then. So there was a young woman that went to pick strawberries there and her basket was taken from her and cut up. And uh, her father was a Gakyakogwantan, a very rich, his name was uh, named Little Grass Father. So he bought a Night Island for her and her tribe. This is the site of the oldest village. It is named, uh, it is now named Plakwan or Yek Andak Woodley Yek, place where a raven fell down. So the story is there were so many houses at this Night Island village that uh, there was so much smoke coming up that when a raven would fly over, it would die from the smoke. So this is where the name it, that comes, comes from it. The other reason we bought the land there was there were some young men spearing salmon at Humpy Creek. The owners of the land took their spears and broke it up and because they did not have permission to, uh, to kill uh, sa uh, salmon at that creek, uh, they, and the, uh, Harry says they, they used the, the, the spears are from, uh, from whale, uh, so they bought the creek too. And this is how my clan end up to be the whole, whole owners of that whole bay. Uh, so these are some of the stories how we became landowners of the Yakutat Bay area. Uh, so through these oral histories, we learn our sacred relationship to place. Uh, and my mom has a quote here. She says, uh, when we came to this area, it was a foreign land. They did not know how to eat or how to live, so the spirits of that place adopted them. They adopted the humans by showing them how to hunt seal. The humans became part of that glacier. They became friends of the spirit of the glacier. That is why now we have a special connection to the glaciers and the mountains that area. So um, this is a course shows a beautiful, um, the beautiful uh, Hubbard Glacier. <coughs> uh, so this is a picture of us at Night Island. Um, uh, the original name is Ganawas, which is not uh, Clinket, it's probably Iyak. Uh, so it's uh, translated to water. Water extends in an indefinite shape. The other name for it is uh, the, called the um, Shaken Eye Land because there were so many people there that the land was shaped. Um, so De Laguna was told that Duke built the first tribal house uh, there. So Duke was still um, 
a name that we carry. So um, when De Laguna did her excavations in 1952, um, they found seven houses and pits at that site in 1952 in her reports in the archaeology of Yakutat Bay. So um, t two years ago, um, when they were doing the excavation, and I think uh, you were there, uh, this is the picture of us uh, in that oldest house pit, the big, big, big house pit, me and my uh, cousin Victoria and her grandson. So it's a huge house, probably as big as this room, and it's a very large house because a lot of the clan houses were a lot smaller. So this shows that they had uh, these huge homes there, and Aaron found a lot more different house pits than De Laguna found. So. Um, uh, so it was a lot bigger than originally estimated from the 1952 report, so it is a lot bigger now. So uh, from his reports, uh, he suggested uh, the test pits uh, possible founding in the mid or late 1400s of the site based on when the glacier retreated and it was uncovered in that area and the archaeological, the test pit that he excavated in that site. Uh, shows that uh, that's the founding of the village. So if you try to figure out how old that village was, plus also how long we had stayed at Icy Bay, uh, you're trying to get an estimate of how we first came down, uh, migrated down the, that area. <coughs> the next village, which they say that we established, we call it, uh, it was called Facing the Mountains. So this is uh, the village that's on the western branch of Lost River or the name is possibly Eak, uh, possibly Spruce Chi. Uh, so that again, so it shows the Eak heritage. So it is uh, the capital of the Kashkakwan after the arrival of the Russians. So if you've ever been to the National Museum of American Indians, you look at the Moon House posts, which are there. Those are originally in that village site. So they said there was uh, four uh, maybe houses at that uh, site. It's the original, the Raven Bones house, which we don't have today, but uh, that's our original mother house that we call it, or the big house, they call it, which is the cheese house, the fort house, and then the mood house people now. Uh, our lieutenant governor is from the fort house. So <laughs> Byron's from the fort house. Uh, my, my auntie here is from the mood house uh, people. So. This is, uh, you know, as, as we talk about our relationships, uh, we, we were all kind of like one, one family with sister houses is how we, we talk about it. <coughs> so uh, as uh, we came into contact with the Westerners, uh, the schooners that were coming in, this is a really old picture of the, the, the houses at uh, Port Mulgrave. Uh, we had our name for it, uh, Suska Village. So it's a uh, name of the village on Kantak Island. It means on the turnstile. So we had six houses there. So there are mechs of, uh, of raven and uh, eagle houses in there. So the, the, when we used to do the lectures on there, we used to talk about these small houses, the house openings here. So you saw say that it was small. So when you had to go in, you would bend over. But if you were uh, raiders, you would be conked on the head. So that's why they built these small holes as you're entering there. So this is, uh, they took a lot of the, the old houses and they put, packed them up and they moved them to this site. So this is when we started the trade between the schooners that were coming in. So this is probably um, founded around 1875 to take advantage of the visiting schooners and abandoned <coughs> by 18, uh, 1893. So this is the, the last village that we established before we uh, came over to the current village of Yakutat where you now now know today. I think this uh, site's on uh, Yakutat Kwan land. So uh, I mentioned that we have many of these sacred uh, sites on the journey. So Mount St. Elias is our atu, we call it Watsay Tusha, Koshka Kwan Creek, the yellow cedar bark townhouse, the Russian fort site, which is the only site uh, now on the National Register, um, which is uh, in that area, the little Fort Island, you now which is a little island uh, in the in there, which is also a Sea Alaska site, um, and it's uh, after um, it was a it's like a little island with a fortress up there, um, and uh, I haven't been able to visit, but I think it'd be really cool because they built a little fort on this little island. There was a shaman's grave at Night Island. Uh, 
the Nesudat site at Lost River that had four of our, was the, the last, we call it the capital of our Kashkakwan. There was also Guchakian on top of a hill village at Summit Lake Village site. Uh, so those are some of our major sites. So this is a Malaspina, photo of Malaspina at uh, the, uh, the first uh, vill uh, foreign vill villagers. And I, I, the picture is not good, but it shows uh, his rendition of some of the totems in the Diakitat area. Um, <coughs> the last site, uh, we call it uh, Wagani Ye, a burned up place. It's a Hlachayik Tekwidi uh, fort site and battle site just in Chapman Bay. So this is part of the, <coughs> the results of the story. My dad tells a story about all the time of the, the clans, two clans that were battling over uh, what was left from the Russian fort site. Uh, one of the um, clans um, were, had a fort up on Sitak River, uh, which is now washed away, but uh, they followed them all the way up to Disenchantment Bay, and they had a fort up in the, up in the uh, glacier area. So this is a, a real important battle site, which has not been documented, which is now somewhere on Forest Service land. So. The problem with the Disenchantment Bay is that uh, it's uh, called a wilderness, designated as a wilderness. And this, uh, the site that we've been excavating is not recognized um, as a, a site. So anyway, <coughs> I wanted to kind of end this uh, with a really uh, story uh, about the Atna, Fred Ewan song. And, uh, if you look at this, you'll recognize this song because uh, our dancers, we call it the Sanadu song, and this is one of our favorite songs. But we've kind of, we call it jazzed it up and clinketized this song. <laughs> <laughs> All as one. <laughs> recognize it they sound exactly like our song that we sing and they call I think um, I was talking to someone they call this a welcome song but it's the same song exact same song that we sing that uh, that uh, Fred E want to sing so uh, I'd like to maybe uh, thank the Sea Alaska Heritage Foundation, uh, the Akitat Klinka tribe, our Yakutat elders, uh, De Laguna for all the awesome research work that she, she did. And I wanted to uh, recognize uh, Marie Francois. We're, we're trying to work on, on her legacy <coughs> um, with the Yakutat Klinka tribe. If Gail is here, Gail, uh, we're gonna meet with Gail and trying to work with um, bringing back a lot of her books and things to Yakutat. Uh, so that's an ongoing project that we have. So I don't know if you have any songs. I went through this real quick, uh, but um, I mainly wanted to emphasize that all the different songs that came with us as we were coming down the coast. And just when you think about our dancers, when you dance, uh, think about the songs that they sing and the history of the songs that uh, we were still carrying today. So uh, hopefully at some time I'll be able to go and actually work with Fred Ewan and record some of the same songs that they sing and um, bring our dancers and share our shared heritage with them. So I'm just going to take a, have a few minutes now to uh, take questions. So if you have any questions, hi Harriet. Long time ago, they traded back and forth. And yeah, you could see it, the artwork of the Yakutat people. They're beading, uh -huh. it's similar to the uh, Athabascans. Yeah, and then the Athabascans language, Navajo could understand them mm -hmm. because uh, many, many years ago, they traveled up and down the coast, up and down the coast. Yeah. There were main, two main trade routes in uh, from Yakutat. One is the Dry Bay trade route that went up the interior up the ALSAC and then that map I was showing you, uh, that was a, another major trade route was the map, uh, as I was mentioning, the prospectors trail, they used to trade the copper down from uh, on that trade route. 
uh, originally. So, uh, but even up and down the coast, we had a lot of trade um, because of the, the copper trade. Uh, we traded our um, strawberries, was a really well-known trade item, uh, goats, uh, because we had goats and the, the, the fat from the goats is a really popular trade item when I was looking at elders, but uh, they used to take the strawberries and dry them and press them um, between, um, I can't remember what, plants and blocks, so that's like dehydrate them and they would trade those as a really popular trade item from Yakutat, yeah. And they would just, my grandma said you would just take a slice off of it in the winter and rehydrate your strawberries, so that looked like a, sounds like a cool project, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Somebody else had raised their hand there. I don't know. Oh, over here. Hi. I just wanted to see if you would you would go back to your your uh, photo of the families, of the clans, and their locations. Oh, okay. Uh, that one. Oh, wait. Oh, where did we switch here? That one. Uh huh. Yeah. You know the Thunderbird people, that's another really cool story from Dry Bay, how the little boy that was caught up in the mountains became a Thunderbird, became a Thunderbird. Uh, that's a really cool story of the Shungu KDB people that were Thunderbirds from that area. Uh, the TKWD has two main uh, house, the drum house lineage and then the bear house lineage. So they came to, Takeaway D were originally from, came in from two different areas. One came over from the interior, another came along the coast. So my grandfather's from the drum, drum house lineage. So they claimed the Anclan River area. That's the lineage of the Takeaway D clan people. So they had, uh, yeah. I think it would be appropriate uh, to mention that you're going to have a, uh, another thing in Anchorage for your mom. Oh, 18th or 19th? Yeah, I'm not sure if we're, we're going to be able to host it. Yeah, thank you. Oh, Lena, hi. Now, I think uh, if there was crooked speakers, understanders, I could tell it all in crooked. I interpreted for my family. My first language was crooked. And this is something I think would be so wonderful if... Uh, the young people really aren't real, have learned, some of them, I'm not accusing anybody of not knowing, but you know, if our younger people uh, knew enough cricket, and you, you can interpret real easy. Mm -hmm. It's not really that hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learned it first in cricket, and then interpreted to, to English, so, uh, for, for the people that is learning, young people, the cricket language, it, it, it's cool to be able to interpret it to uh, English like Judy has done. I'm proud of Judy. She has come in there to learn everything that she can. and. Uh, it's something that, you know, there's your, your clan that you learn uh, while you're growing up. The elders were the babysitters, and uh, the aunts and maternal aunts and uncle taught the parents when you know, when they're young, how to cook, how to put up fish, how to hunt, the whole thing. And, and we were just as pretty as anybody else working mechanics or the different jobs that people have in this day and age. Our people taught uh, elders and, and young people how to hunt and survive in this country. I'm just expressing my own feeling. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to take Judy's mm -hmm. place. I'm just taking questions, I think, thank you. Uh, she has hung in there all these years of going to school, like her mother has. Mm -hmm. And it's a good thing. I've been teaching cricket from now 
when I moved back to Yakutat, I started, I think, in 74. And so, uh, because I could speak uh, quick at fluently and being my first language and interpreting for my parents, because they couldn't read or write or even talk, so it was easier for me to pick up things that was taught in Kunkit that Judy's been talking to you about in English. And so I'm just saying this because there might be other Kunkit teachers in this <laughs> house. And I thank you, Judy, thank you. for the presentation. Yeah, it, it's just a short, short history, but if you're ever at a potlatch, it'll be the longer version. <laughs> 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 Thank you. I, think I would volunteer uh, <laughs> at any time to tell this story in Punkia. Yeah. You know, but she started to wear from the beginning to the end of that migration. And I was just saying, I'm just volunteering for the people that could talk and understand Punkia. Yeah. I would go through it. Not today, though. I'm tired. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it was nice. I enjoyed it. Do you have a follow-up then? Yeah, I just wanted to ask about your 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 studies and and how hard was it to get um, information from like Sea Alaska, the 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 for or the the. Uh, I was listening to you earlier talking about some of the the information and how hard it was to <laughs> so was, collect data or um, history. I was fortunate. Um, Bob, Bob back there, Bob Schroeder. Uh, I had two grants that I worked with on um, behalf of one with Forest Service, the other with National Park Service. And that one, I think, was from the subsistence committee to document the traditional use of our land. So I started uh, a lot of that information about our sacred sites and things I collected through a grant that he gave to the tribe. And I, I worked with, uh, for the tribe on documenting all our history and clans and our traditional place names. So that would be a good place to start is start mapping our traditional subsistence areas. And I mapped it by eight species. And then documenting the traditional place names and our sacred sites, our old village sites, and putting that together in a document so that if anyone comes and asks these questions about uh, which clans, where their traditional sites are, how do they traditionally use the site. So that would be a good place for people to start doing the research on their own history, document uh, their traditional names, which clans have their names and things like that, document all the songs that the clan owns. And as I showed you, all the songs relate to different places along the journey. So I was fortunate. Uh, when I came back, I wanted to raise my, my, son, my son and daughter here in a village, so I was able to get uh, work on the tribe with these different grants that was available. So that's a lot of it I collected from uh, Material de Laguna and other researchers had left and um, put it together in a document. So that's how you know, we, we started this research and put it together and, and shared it. I shared a lot of that research with Sea Alaska because we're trying to get all these secret sites that are like, I mentioned Forest Service, didn't recognize that site up in uh, Disenchantment Bay. The old sealing camps and the battle sites are not recognized. So we got to work with Sea Alaska and other organizations to, um, to get these sites recognized by the government. They're not recognized now, right now, even though that we've proven that these sites and we did excavations up in Disenchantment Bay and showed that we used to have all the ceiling there. And then those, I don't know if you, you know, if Chuck wanted to mention that that's not a recognized site by Forest Service, the one we excavated up there. It's also a battle site too. But uh, a lot of things have to be worked on, yeah. Thank who, you. Who helped you through Sea Alaska with, with information? Well, uh, a lot of it uh, was, you know, um, just information I, I found through the Laguna's research and other research that's already documented and research all that historical information. And they have a lot of information in the archives too that uh, we've been able to access. So uh, those songs, 
Yeah, the songs originally collected by De Laguna that I played, and they're now on the American Philosophical Society website. So well, we were fortunate De Laguna did all that research in Yakutat that we have all that information, uh, have to have access to it. So a lot of communities are not as lucky as we to have someone like De Laguna that did all that research. Uh, we're lucky she was there to document that history, yeah. I think the next step would be to, 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 to access, if we can, to access the songs collected by Freddy De Laguna in Chitna. <laughs> Yeah, and I think a lot of that is on that American Philosophical Society, but someone that knows that uh, from that community needs to go in there and fill in the background like I did. I know the migration story and I know the, the meaning and history behind those songs because that's not on there. But, but somebody who knows the song because it's very difficult to recognize the song from that in the other them. Yeah. Like some of those uh, titles that were given, they kind of don't relate to, right. to, to uh, how we use it. So they're, they're the, the, they just were collected without the meaning <coughs> and the use of the songs. So someone from the community needs to put in that effort to say how these songs are used and the meaning and history behind the songs that were collected, just like I did with this presentation, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, Judy, thank you very much for your presentation. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's a lot of Kwashka Kwans here, and all of us basically that are here are in support of you mm -hmm. on your research. My question I have, and I've always had this question ever since I was pretty young, mm -hmm. is what happened to Yeg Hit, Yeg Saga Hit, and Anyawa Hit? You know, I every time I try to ask the question, what happened to these houses of the Kosh Kwan, Kina Kwan? And I still find no answer. Yeah, you're talking about the Raven Bones house? Raven's Bones house, Raven Raven House, and house in the middle, on you a hit. Yeah, I just know like some of those houses um, became um, divided up to the current houses. Uh, they were originally the original mother house, and as a community is either migrated or they became uh, bigger people, they would divide into smaller houses. So I'm, I figure some of those smaller houses, maybe um, with the, all the epidemics that happened, because there are several major epidemics that killed off um, a lot of our, 90% um, of our population. Uh, a lot of the villages, stories I've heard says like some of the villages were totally killed off by epidemics. And uh, they say there's one story about a one man that was sent to, res, uh, to, to go back to one of these dead communities and bring back a stone lamp, because that stone lamp was precious. And he went in there and everyone, the whole village was dead, and this is from Yakutat. So the epidemics probably killed off a large part of a, at least 50 to 90 percent of the population of the whole Northwest Coast was the ma major epidemics. So it could have been all died from epidemics too, possibly, yeah. You know, um, I went to see the movie, The Way of the Human Being, Harold Napoleon. <laughs> they talked about the uh, Great White Death or something. Yeah. The epidemic. I was wondering, uh, my grandmother, Mary Addie Worthington Johnson, Chester Worthington's wife, one of the founding fathers, and he had beaten. Her skin was uh, brown here, and then when she'd take her shirt off, she was white here. She had dark spots on her arms from smallpox mm -hmm. and the epidemic. What I'm wondering is uh, the shamans, because she was kind of, she turned her upstairs into a sick bay helping people as well. Mm -hmm. uh, in Yakutat, uh, I know that your grandfather was a chief mm -hmm. of Abraham, and I, and I was just wondering, did uh, they have medicine women too, like, uh, you know, the uh, what they call them now, I forgot what they, shamans or? Yeah. They, they did. Uh, my name is um, Tahutsu. It's one of the uh, female shaman, uh -huh. and uh, she was one of the ones that I know of uh, that was a female shaman. There, um, there's a certain time of year because women had their menses. They couldn't become shaman during their menses, so they had to be older, I think, to become a shaman. But the shamans I know had to be raised in that uh, tradition, you know, be taught when they were small. So. The only female shaman I know, I don't know if Lena knows the other one, is uh, the Hutsu, was a female shaman that predicted the coming of the Russians. Mm -hmm. And there's some other stories about her, too. Yeah. 
So they did have female shamans, but there was not very many sh female shamans. So that's one of the, the stories of my name is, is uh, Dakutsu. Now, De Laguna said the original name of Dakutsu is Yakutsu, which is Atma. So I have a note from her that I saved somewhere what my name is. Under Mount Sinalais. Yeah. And that is available by PDF online, uh, so you can download it actually, I think, too, and then buy it too. If you want a hard copy from, <laughs> from Marie. I am going to bring boxes of hard copies. Uh, yeah. So she had it recruited, so if you want to buy a copy of the three volume set from Marie there, just let her know. The, the one thing about shamans, though, is that if uh, coming from Chitna, they would come from the Copper River, and on the Copper River people, women could be shaman more easily than they could in uh, along the coast. Oh. Because my, my first husband, Philip Marino, when I was first married to him at Mount Edgecombe, he was a practical nurse. Maggie Henry, Maggie Adams, Harry, came and said, don't forget I'm your real grandmother. Mm -hmm. So his mother was taken to Wrangell when she was a baby, Emma Johnson, mm -hmm. I mean Cake and adopted into the Johnsons there. Mm. But uh, all my kids are going back to Yakutat. Mm. In fact, they call your mom auntie and you're their cousins, you yeah. know, and it uh, was a great loss when we lost your mom. Mm -hmm. And uh, she gave my grandson a name mm -hmm. and my daughter was so honored, mm. so honored when we lost Johnny. Mm -hmm. So when we go to her memorial again on June 18th, uh, uh, that's one thing that uh, she encouraged us all to educate ourselves, you know, because we had to compete in the white man's world. It wasn't easy because we're not, we don't think the way they do. A dollar is a dollar, but it's not almighty dollar to us. And when we trade, food means more to us than a dollar because we didn't have cash those days. But thank you for your presentation you. and your per you, persistence.